Again, it is a blessing for us to be assembled together this Lord's Day morning, to be able to worship God in spirit and in truth, and now to have the opportunity to open up God's Word and consider another portion of it, its meaning and application to our lives today. I want to talk about the precious blood of Christ this morning. The passage that we just had, we'll get to 1 Peter 1 in just a moment. The passage that was just read for us, I want to read verse 11 again. Leviticus 17 and verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. The sacredness of life, of course, comes from the fact that it is given by God. But God says that our blood plays a very important role. He has given it an important role in maintaining that life. It was not proven scientifically and medically that blood carries life-sustaining oxygen and nutrients throughout the body until many centuries later. But here, God reveals this fact unto Moses. Life is in the blood. Blood is a very important theme. It is quite a startling image that is used all throughout the Bible. You could, you could say that blood flows throughout the Bible. It is a very important theme. God has given blood as that which makes atonement for sin. In chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, sin enters into the picture. It becomes a reality. Something has to be done about that. And that something is connected with blood. Now, we come to our text I want us to use as our, our starting point, at least we get our title from this text, and that is from 1 Peter at chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. The Apostle Peter is writing to these Christians who are suffering terribly for their faith. And any time you're suffering for a cause, there is the temptation to give up on that cause and to turn back away from it. And, and Peter is writing, in, in part, to remind them that what they have is worth suffering for, and to hang on to it. He says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The Holy Spirit led Peter to write and to say that the blood of Christ is precious. That's a word that we don't often define, but I don't think we have a hard time grasping the meaning of that word, what it means to be precious. This is something that is special. This is something that is to be cherished. It is something that is to be held on to, to be put up, to be revered, to be celebrated, if you will. The blood of Christ is precious. It is valuable. It is important to us. I mean, after all, we memorialize it every Sunday. We just did that a few moments ago. And I appreciate the song, the Lamb of God, and I appreciate the comments about the table. And as we partook of the bread and we partook of the fruit of the vine, we remembered that shed blood of Christ, that blood which is precious. We're going to talk about why it is that the blood of Christ is precious. Why is it more valuable than silver or gold? Why is it the most valuable thing that we have access to today? What makes the blood of Christ precious? What makes it valuable? I want to look at five things. Five things the Scriptures tell us that the blood of Christ does and, and try to try to help us to understand and appreciate why it is precious. Let's start in the text right here where we're at. The Apostle Peter writes and says that you're not redeemed from your aimless conduct. You're not redeemed from your old way of life with silver or gold, but you're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Redemption is another important theme found throughout the Scriptures. To redeem means to cause to be released. or set free. Think about freedom. Think about liberation. That's the idea behind redemption, to liberate by payment of a ransom. It's not just a matter of going and unlocking a gate and now we're free. No, we're, we're being held. One is being held for ransom. There's a price that has to be paid. 
Whenever I think about redemption or I think about redeem, I think about a pawn shop. I like to go to a pawn shop every once in a while. You never know what you can find in there. But there's, there's an idea behind, behind the, the, the process of what happens at a pawn shop. If you are in need of some money, you can take something of value and take it to a pawn shop and you can agree upon a price, a price that they'll give you, and they will keep that thing of value in pawn and give you some money, and you've got some time to come back and to redeem that, to buy that out of pawn. But you can't just show up with the ticket and say, I want it back now. You've got to show up with your ticket and whatever price it is that you agreed upon. It'd be whatever money they gave you plus whatever they want to charge you on top of that. You can't get that out of pawn without paying that redemption price. When you and I sinned, the price that we paid for sin is we put our soul in hock to Satan. He took possession of our soul the first time we chose to sin. Uh, sin is a bondage. And the Bible talks about it that Jesus in John chapter 8, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. But Paul goes into more detail here in Romans chapter 6. I want us to turn and look at these verses. Some of these verses today we'll have up on the slides. Many of them uh, we'll be turning to on our own Bibles. And that's the case here uh, with Romans chapter 6. And let's look at verses 16 through 18. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, rather of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God bethink that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So here's this idea of redemption. We're liberated. We're set free from sin. Notice what Paul says here in our text in Romans. Romans chapter 6 and at verse 17 that you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. We, we are set free from sin when we obey from the heart the form of doctrine. What is the form of doctrine? You back up in chapter 6 and at verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We're talking here about baptism. We're talking about the action of baptism. But we're also in this study, we're talking about the blood of Christ. Where was it that Jesus shed His blood? It was at His death. When Jesus died, that's where His blood was shed. How is it that you and I come into contact with that shed blood? It's by becoming contacted with His death, and we're baptized into His death. And so that form of doctrine is that we must be baptized in order to contact the death of Christ, to contact the blood of Christ, and thus be redeemed from our sins. So there's, there's what we have to do in order to be redeemed. Our deliverance from sin is obtained when we obey from the heart the form of doctrine. However, the deliverance from sin had to be made available by paying a ransom. Remember again, you, you, you want to get that thing out of pawn, you've got to pay the price in order to get our souls out of the grip of Satan. A price had to be paid, and that ransom price was death. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. He gave His life when He shed His blood. Life is in the blood. He gave that willingly on the cross. It wasn't taken from Him. He gave it willingly. In Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1 verse 7, the Apostle Paul sets forth this payment price for our redemption. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. How is it that you and I are liberated, set free from the bondage of sin? It's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Silver and gold can't do that. In our hand, no price we can bring. It's the blood of Jesus Christ 
that sets us free from sin, that redeems us. But let's look on. We've got four other things I want to consider. We, we know also the Bible teaches that the shed blood of Jesus Christ gives us remission of our sins. Remission of our sins. In the book of Hebrews, and I mentioned that, that blood is found all through the Bible. Well, it's found in the book of Hebrews quite often, especially in chapters 9 and 10 where it talks about the work that Jesus does as our high priest, not using the blood of bulls and goats, but His own shed blood. In Hebrews at chapter 9 and verse 22, Hebrews 9.22 says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. That verse ties us back with the one we started with in Leviticus 17.11. That blood is given for atonement. There is no atonement. And what is atonement? Atonement is paying a price, satisfying a requirement or a price. And that atonement price is the shedding of blood. So there has to be the shedding of blood, but here's the catch. Down in chapter 10 of Hebrews in verse 4, Hebrews 10 verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Why is that so? Because it wasn't a bull or a goat who sinned, it was a man that sinned. And so it's not the, the blood of a bull or a goat that makes atonement for that sin, it's the blood of a man. And it wasn't just any man that sinned. In Genesis chapter 3, it was a perfect man who sinned. And so it's going to take perfect blood. The precious blood of Christ is of a lamb without spot, and without blemish. Jesus is that perfect sacrifice. Well, in Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, Matthew chapter 26, and let's look at verses 27 and 28. Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28, Then He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus was going to the cross on this night that He instituted this supper, and before He went, He left us this memorial, which, which not only memorialized His body, but also this blood. The shedding of the blood represents the giving of a life, because life is in the blood, and Jesus says it's going to be shed for the remission of of sins. What does remission mean? As it's used in this text, and as it's used in other places in the New Testament, the word remission means to dismiss or to release, to grant freedom or to grant pardon. That's the idea of remission. It's used in the New Testament with reference to the forgiveness of sins. But I want you to have in your mind, with remission, there's that idea of release. You're released, you are let go. I, in doing some study, I found that this, this Greek word and this concept as it's used in the New Testament, remission is exemption from the consequences of an offense. We are still guilty of the offense, but we will not have to face the consequences. What are the consequences of sin? The wages of sin is death. And of course, we're all going to die physically because sin has entered into the world. But what we truly want to avoid is what John calls in the book of Revelation the second death. And that is the eternal punishment for our sins. Through Christ, through the blood of Christ, we can be released from that consequence of our sins. I want us to note another place where this word remission is found, and, and we use it very prominently, is in Acts chapter 2. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. The apostle Peter preaches to these Jews who have assembled there on Pentecost and tells them that they are guilty of a severe transgression. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
So here we have Jesus, who is God's Son. He's been made our Lord. He's been made our Christ. But what have we done? We have crucified Him. We have put Him to death. There's going to be some consequences to that action. And they don't have to be convinced of that. They understand that very clearly. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They believed every word of it. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is Lord, that He is Christ, and that they are guilty of crucifying Him. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Knowing that they believe, then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. So that that penalty, the wrath of God that you understand you're now under, that can be let go. You can be released from that. If you'll do what? Just believe? No, they already believe. What are they told to do? They're told to repent and to be baptized. Remember in baptism, that's where we contact that death. That's where we contact that blood. And then those sins will be remitted. For the remission of sins. That doesn't mean because your sins have already been remitted, it means in order to have your sins remitted, in order to have your sins forgiven. So so what happens when we contact the blood of Jesus Christ? We have the remission of our sins. What does that mean? That means that we will not have to face the consequences of our sins, the spiritual eternal consequences of our sins. But I want you to notice the definition here. The definition says remission is exemption from the consequences of an offense, but it doesn't take away the guilt of that offense. So with the blood of Jesus Christ, the consequences can still be gone, but we still have that guilt. And if our conscience is is worth anything at all, we feel that guilt. And we know that we, before God, we are still an offender, we are still a sinner, And we're not at peace with God. That's where this next term comes in. The blood of Jesus Christ justifies us. Justifies us. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, here the Apostle Paul is once again talking about the death of Christ. Where he shed his blood. Romans chapter 5 and at verse 9 we read, Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Justification is another important theme in the Bible. We don't talk about it much, but it's there, and it's very much a legal type of word. Justification is the legal and formal acquittal from guilt. It means to acquit or declare just, to be pronounced and treated as righteous. Justification is not the suspension of a sentence. Justification is the dropping of all charges. So here's where justification comes in. Sometimes we look at at redemption, and we look at remission, and justification, and salvation, and we tie all these words together in a bundle, because in the end, they all result in the same thing. But there's some distinction in these terms. And here's where a distinction in, in justification is important. With remission of sins, the consequence is gone, but the guilt is still there. We're still an offender. But justification comes in, and God bangs the gavel and says, not guilty, and the charge is gone. The charge is gone. And from that moment on, God can truly and justly treat us as if we are innocent of our sins. Even though we have committed them, that charge is gone. God, listen, God does not withhold punishment for our sins because He overlooks sins. God cannot overlook sin. God withholds punishment from sin whenever the blood of Jesus Christ makes us right before God. The blood of Jesus removes the offense. And this is an important concept to understand. That the blood of Jesus Christ, when it is applied to our soul by God, 
The blood of Jesus does not cover up our sins. The blood of Jesus removes those sins. And that's important because there, there is an idea that exists out there in, in religion at large that, that the blood of Jesus covers us and that the righteousness of Christ covers us so that whenever God looks down upon us, God doesn't see us, God sees His Son. And I've heard that, I've heard that idea come from people, not in the church, but outside the church, the idea that, that this is how righteousness works, this is how justification works, that the blood of Jesus covers us and hides our sin from God. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the blood of Jesus removes those sins. And with those sins gone, Jesus will look upon us and say, what guilt? God will look upon us and say, what charge? You're innocent. And that's the blood of Jesus that does that. That's not you and I coming and bringing all the silver and gold we can and buying our way out of, out of a charge. No. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that will justify us before God. That will, that will cause God to look upon us and say, not guilty. And that gives us peace with God. Let's look at the next thing. and It has to do with this idea of the blood of Jesus washing us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. Sin has a contaminating effect upon our hearts and upon our souls. I love the way the book of Isaiah begins. It begins by God calling upon His people to come and to reason with Him. He says, stop coming to my temple and offering worship unto me because your hands are filthy with sin. Uh, verse 16 in Isaiah 1, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, cleanse yourselves. Why? Look at verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's what sin does to us. Sin leaves a stain on our souls. We can't see it. It's something that happens in the spiritual realm, something that happens to us spiritually. We can't see it, but God can see it. Just as you can see the difference between crimson and snow, God can see it. And as, if we have that filth of sin, we can't come near God. We can't approach God. This word here for scarlet, though your sins are like scarlet, in the Hebrew that word is taken from, from the word for a red dye that could not be removed by any launderer. That was a stain, and it was a permanent stain. And God's saying, oh, I can take care of that stain if you'll come to me. If you'll come to me. And how is He able to do it? Well, it's not until we get to the New Testament that we see He's able to do that through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Anything that is brought before God's presence has to be pure and holy. You don't have to read the Bible very long to see that, to appreciate that. Remember in Genesis 3, whenever Adam and Eve sinned, they were driven out. Why? Because they had sinned. They could no longer be in the garden in the presence of God. What do you think whenever I mention the book of Leviticus to you? Honestly, what thought comes to your mind? How many of you are thinking, that's my favorite book in the Bible? Not many of us. The book of Levit Le Leviticus, I've never heard anyone say that's their favorite book in the Bible. Now, if you were living in the Old Testament times and you were a priest, maybe so. Because the book of Leviticus was written to the priest. It was written to them and it told them all of their responsibilities. And that's why when you and I read Leviticus today, we, we read about all these different things that have to be done and, and these specifications and all these different kind of sacrifices that had to be made for all these different kinds of things. And well, when we get to chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu burning up, well, that's exciting. But other than that, we're not really excited about the book of Leviticus. And if we, if we, if we turn away from that, that's unfortunate. Because really, the theme to the book of Leviticus is be holy, for I am holy. 
And that is a concept that definitely is brought through to you and I as Christians today. All we'd have to do is go back where we started in 1 Peter chapter 1, and Peter quotes this passage from Leviticus, Be holy as I am holy. That's the theme of the book of Leviticus. The word holy, H-O-L-Y, holy, is mentioned 95 times in the book of Leviticus. That's not taking into account the other forms of that word. Just the word holy is mentioned 95 times. What is it that makes us holy? What is it that has to be done to maintain that holiness? The word blood is mentioned 89 times in the book of Leviticus. It's that blood that has to be shed to make us holy. And here that this image back there that... Those, those priests and Levites would have to go back and to those sacrifices over and over again and do them right. And there was that blood, that dirty, messy blood that was shed all the time. Well, it's that blood that makes us holy before God. And so we come to the New Testament and we have the Lamb of God, capital L, Lamb of God, Jesus, shedding His blood. And it's His blood that cleanses us of our sins. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 5, John says of Jesus to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Washed us of our sins. Again, don't let anyone tell you that, our, that the blood of Jesus covers up our sins. No. The blood of Jesus washes those sins. They are gone. They are gone. Well, what about after the point of baptism? What about as Christians, as you and I continue to live and serve God, we're going to sin. Yes, we are going to sin, but the blood of Jesus even then washes away our sins. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we are walking in the light, we have access to that blood and that blood will wash away those sins. Not automatically. Notice there's a condition that has to be met here in verse 9. Acts chapter 8 verse 22 mentions other parts of that condition as well. We must repent of our sins. We must confess. We must ask God for forgiveness. And the promise is that those sins will be washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. That money that we put in the plate every week, that doesn't wash away sins. It's that blood that we commemorate every week. That's what washes away our sins. There's one more thing. I said I had five I wanted to look at. The blood of Jesus sanctifies us. In the book of Hebrews, at chapter 13 and verse 12, the writer says, Therefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered outside the gate. Again, it's not the blood of bulls and goats. It's His own blood that He shed. Hebrews chapter 9, He entered into the holy place with His own blood. And here, in chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews, He sanctifies His people with His own blood. The word sanctify means to set aside or to set apart to God. When you and I are cleansed, when we're washed of our sins in the blood of Jesus Christ, that makes us different from the world. And in that, we are set apart, we are set aside. But that's not the full meaning that we need to get of the word sanctification. The word sanctification also includes in it the idea that we are set aside or consecrated for a purpose. And that is for God. Think, think about it this way. I like to think about sanctification this way. Maybe it's an oversimplification, but I'm an overly simplified person. So, You have a big dinner at your house. Let's say you invited me. You have a big dinner at your house, and afterwards you've got a lot of dirty dishes. What do you do with those dirty dishes? Well, you can't use them again, so you clean them. 
you draw some soapy water in the sink and you put a dish in there and you scrub it and you rinse it off and it's clean. It's clean. And now you set it aside. You set it aside now. It can now be used. When you and I are in sin, we're in the filth of sin. We're not of any use to God whatsoever. But when we come to Christ and we plunge ourselves into His cleansing blood, we are cleansed of our sins, and we are now set aside to be used by God. We're now able to be used in service unto Him. And it takes the blood of Jesus Christ to be able to bring that about. The blood of Jesus sanctifies us, causes us to be in fellowship with God, in fellowship with Christ, in fellowship with other believers, and especially... Now we can be in service to God as His own special people. We can't do that with silver or gold. We can only do that through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we won't spend as as much time looking at sanctification as we have these other things. And I'll tell you that there, there are other things we could look at. It's not just five things the blood of Jesus does. There are other things we can look at as well, but, but looking at these five it gives us an idea of why the Holy Spirit would have the Apostle Peter refer to the blood of Christ as precious. It is precious, it is special, it is valuable because it and it alone can bring about the great work of redeeming us, setting us free from our sins, remitting our sins so that we don't have to face the eternal consequences of those sins, and justifying us so that we don't have to forever carry the tag as, I'm an offender, I've sinned before God, but no God says, not guilty, because those sins have been washed away. We're cleansed in the blood of Christ. Not covered up, but we're cleansed. And because we are cleansed, then we are set apart, set aside to be of service unto God. That's what makes the blood of Jesus so precious. I spent some time this week in in studying this and looking at things that are of value. And I, I went to the internet with a search engine and I typed in the most valuable element in the universe. And of course, if if it's on the internet, then it's true, right? But I found an interesting article, the most valuable element in the universe is something called francium. And if I'm mispronouncing that, then you can correct me later. Francium. Here's the thing about francium. Although francium occurs naturally, it decays so quickly that it cannot be collected for use. Only a few atoms of francium have been produced commercially. So, if you want to produce 100 grams of francium, you could expect to pay a few billion dollars for it. And that makes it the most valuable element in the universe. I don't know about that. Because when you and I are standing before the Lord on Judgment Day, and the fate of our souls is is in the balance, we're not going to be looking for a big pile of francium that we can offer up to the Lord in exchange for our soul. Having silver, having gold, having platinum, plutonium, francium, whatever it is that we want to attach value to here, the only thing that we're going to care about on that day is what saves our soul. And the only thing that saves our soul is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why I contend that the blood of Jesus is the most valuable element in the universe. Because without it, you and I have no hope for eternity whatsoever. Have you been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you come to to the Lord Not claiming that you have righteousness of your own. Not claiming that you've got your parents' religion. Have you come to Jesus Christ? Have you come to God with nothing but the blood of Jesus? Because that's the only thing 
that can save us. Yes, there are conditions that must be met. We must believe and repent and confess and be baptized. We must live faithfully after that. But what empowers all of that is the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't ever say we don't believe in the blood of Jesus here at Norway. It underlies our salvation. Our salvation is nothing without it. Do you need to be saved? You know, there was one who took that step this past Thursday evening trusted in the free gift of salvation offered through Jesus Christ. And that invitation continues to be extended right now. I don't know how much money you'd have to give to, to get some gold or some silver or what is it, a hundred grands of francium? You need a couple billion dollars. The blood of Jesus is free. It's free if you'll just come and take it on God's terms. Think about the words of this song as we sing it. And if you have a spiritual need, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song?